everybody. Welcome to the Art Workshop. I'm Christopher Epling. Thank you so much for tuning in today. We have an exciting show for you. Uh, of course, during the recording of this show, we are in winter. Winter's upon us, so we have designed a couple of shows here with some activities surrounding doing some work with winter, winter themed. Um, one thing we do want to show you before we get started today, we have some submissions that came in with some local artists, um, actually two today. Um, one is uh, from someone from Henderson County. Um, Travis Shanks, he's 26. This is some really bright and colorful work. Um, he sent in actually a few. There's this one with the train and then the horse. And as you all know, if you've seen some past episodes of the Art Workshop, horses are hard. But uh, Travis has done a great job with this. It's just amazing work. This, of course, is um, his uh, profile shot of, a, of one of his characters. It's just amazing work. And also, um, nine years old check out this gunslinger from caleb osborne from banner kentucky i also saw a short video of uh, uh, caleb drawing um, in front of his entire class at school which is tremendously hard to do when you draw in front of people believe me i know for for first-hand experience and he did he did this amazing job he did uh, i think donald duck so just some really cool and amazing talented artist right around our area. Now, if you at home maybe have something you'd like to share, we would love to show our viewing audience. Uh, just send that work to me at epplingillustrations at gmail.com. And any questions you might have too, we love to have questions to come in from the viewing audience. Actually, we have a couple today we're gonna to touch on, but we really wanna show your work. So you can also actually share your work with me on my Facebook page. So if you just look for Epling Illustrations on Facebook, that's an easy way also to share it. So either way, just please send in your work. We would love to show our viewing audience. Now, a couple questions come in today before we get started with their activity. We want to touch on these two very important questions, done with two different mediums. The first is pastels. This comes from Jeremy Gibson, Pottville, Kentucky. What's the best paper to use with pastels? It's a great question. It's a question that uh, I had to find the answer to myself. And a lot of trial and error, of course, um, ended up landing on something that works for me. What works for me might not work for Jeremy or anyone else, but I do have a suggestion with this. So pastels are very brittle. They're very uh, flaky, very chalky, of course, uh, medium. They come in these bricks, which are just really, really hard to deal with if you don't have the right paper. If you have very slick paper, you're going to have a time with these because they don't really transfer um, to the paper that well. Of course, obviously, the more toothy the paper is, I know that really doesn't maybe make a lot of sense, but it will in a second. The more tooth that the paper has, the better. And I really had no idea before I started working within um, publishing is all the different amounts of paper there, there are. And so here's just a small example. So everything that you see here on these little tabs are different weights of paper. And this is just um, an example um, covers of different papers that you can purchase from this one particular company and if you go online you can ac actually request these examples to be sent to you from um, other companies so this is for instance a 80 pound white paper with a vellum smooth surface and when i started researching more about the different types of tooth with paper and here you could see if you could feel this you would notice that there's a ton of different varieties here on each one of these little pads dealing with the tooth of the paper and of course paper is made up of small fibers if you would look under a microscope you would see all these tiny little tubes running um, inside of this uh, sheet of paper and those little tubes however many there are and the width of those uh, also affect the grade of the paper so when you talk about the weight of a paper 80 pound 100 pound so on and so forth you also have the tooth of the paper so if you have anything that's covered with vellum you may see a vellum surface that's really good for inks wet mediums and as you know pastels are not wet at all so I have about an 80 pound medium tooth paper here that I have and you can see with this um, it holds the pastel pretty good and what you want actually is a variety you don't necessarily want it to be really really smooth but you also don't want it to be so that it just um, takes a lot of the chalk more so than the actual medium being applied what you do with pastels of course is on the blending so I'm going to use my thumb here, of course, or my finger, but you can see on this paper, 80 pound, it has a really uh, nice um, surface for blending. And, and so I suggest anything 80 pound and up with a nice tooth, no vellum, stay away from slick surfaces. That's my advice for pastels. I have a second question now. This is on the same kind of 
say medium in a way. I mean, we're still dealing with dry mediums. We're still dealing with um, sticks of, of, um, of uh, mediums here with the colored pencils. We have a question that's come in with that as well. So we're talking about blending now. Uh, Lena, I think how you pronounce that, Cheney or Lena. Sorry if I mispronounced that from Jenkins, Kentucky. She asked, how do you blend colored pencils? Can you blend them without adding more color? Now that is a huge problem for artists who work a lot with colored pencils because if you know anything about colored pencils, you know that usually how you blend is by adding more medium on top of the medium that's existing already on the paper. So for instance, I have an example here. I have a few ranges of green and typically what would happen when you're going to blend is that you would lay down some of the medium on the paper, such as this, it's really light, I know, and then what you would do is you would find the next uh, hue up from that, just a slight variation up, and then you would color on top of that particular um, application of that color, and then you would continue on, so on and so forth, continually adding more to it, and this is more of a brownish green, but you can see how this kind of works. Now some artists will actually take that after they've colored a surface, They'll take white over top of this and they will blend all this together um, using just a regular white uh, color pencils. Now that's one way of doing it, but this is adding more color on top, exactly what Lena asked if we can avoid doing that. And the way that I've found to avoid doing that is actually uh, baby oil. So baby oil is just the right uh, type of um, uh, combination of molecules that will allow us to allow us to get the color pencil, the pigment, um, wet enough and oily enough to start to blend. Um, now I use a um, extender whenever I start to get low on a certain color um, and I have a colorless blender here too as well which is not adding color. So we're going to try both these out real fast before we get into our activity and we're going to see kind of how they both work. Okay. All right. So I have here again a range of green. So I'll apply this again. There's one. And then, of course, the second. And we'll go a little darker this time, see if we can't really test out this application. Of course, that would break, but I have a backup. We're okay. This is actually a Prismacolor color pencils. You can use whatever brand you want, but actually the brand does affect how they blend. The more high quality you get within your color pencils, the more, um, I guess, right combination, again, of how this, this pigment is, 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 is um, processed and it will actually give us just enough of this uh, uh, oily uh, substance here or whatever this might be the inside of baby oil to blend well because Prismacolor has a lot of the right pigment in it, the right oil to the pigment. So the pigment itself is not too chalky. There's an oil based um, additive to color pencils and you can see if you apply this enough on the right paper there there is a blend that starts to happen. It starts to it starts to blend, but you also have to apply it so that you're preparing for the blend. So for instance, if you go light to dark, you don't necessarily want this hard break that I have right here. So you may want to um, just be careful on how you blend. So you're still going to have to work the medium. You're still going to have to work with how, you know, applying a little bit of color on top of the other, and then you can press down harder. It is in how you apply it. It's all about application and actually today's little activity that we have is talking about application and now you can see how I went from light to dark and now let's see if that helps a little bit more with our blending and it seems to seems to work and if you have a heavier paper watercolor paper might be best for this and now let's just test out the colorless blender real fast using the same uh, colors here again so we have the light green a little bit darker Pressing down very lightly at first and harder as I go further to the right and then a little bit darker. Now let's use our colorless blender. Now technically I guess uh, Elena this is not um, using um, not using any, uh, something other than uh, colored pencils to blend with because this is an actual um, type of color pencil. It's a PC1077 Prismacolor colorless blender and you can see I'm pressing down pretty hard but there is a blending that's starting to happen. So I guess it's up to you, whatever you know you think works best. It, not too much of a difference, I don't think. So, you know, you could try, you know, some baby oil and um, use it sparingly. But my advice again is the thickness of the paper does matter. Use it on some really thin paper, you're gonna have a real oily mess. All right, for today's activity, we're gonna be talking about application as well. And 
keeping in theme with winter, um, we're going to use watercolor. Again, I love watercolor. It's probably the best medium for us to uh, retain white in space and negative space. Negative space meaning just there's no color there. And really fast, grab your pencil. We're going to just sketch out a small scene. I guess we'll do it this way. Yeah, let's do it this way. And what we're going to do is start down at the bottom of your paper, sort of in the middle, and we're going to sketch out a cabin. Really simple. If you can make a uh, triangle with rounded edges, you can draw this. So start out like that, just a, this rounded shape at the bottom. This is a small little cabin in the woods, and we're going to now bring this in just a little bit on each side, just a bit. This is going to extend further in than the other side here. Now we're going to make another triangle. This one's a little sharper than this oval, this um, shape we have at the top, which is more rounded tip to it. This could be a little sharper. And then let's go ahead and place a rectangle right here. This is our door. And we're going to make a little quaint cabin in the woods surrounded by a very deep snowfall. This would be, of course, the eave. And on the sides of our cabin, we're going to have this come down here and here. A simple little shape, a simple little cabin in the woods. And the side of our cabin, going off into the distance in the back, we're going to actually put some tall evergreens. So we have a small cabin here, just a series of rectangles and straight lines making up um, our cabin. Now, let's put a chimney right here. So we'll just put a small shape here with two lines and then, of course, a rectangle at the top. And we'll add some more features to that as we go. If you want some window panes in your window, do that as well. And, of course, to your door. So just by using a variation of lines and shapes, we've created this small little cabin. Now, surrounding our cabin, what I want you to do is extend the line out on each side like this. Okay, once you have that, the next thing we're going to do is put our trees. Now, I don't want you to draw um, all the different little branches on our trees yet. We're going to do that actually with watercolor instead. What I do want you to do right now is go ahead and draw these series of parallel lines. So you notice I have a series that's getting taller as it goes away from the cabin here. So that's important to have these extend taller than the one previous to it. We're going to go in a little closer to the cabin now, drawing a few and a few in the back here. And then we're going to do the same thing on this side, parallel lines extending up, each one a little taller than the one before it, because this is going to be our framework now for our pine trees in a second once we start using color, okay? And we're just sketching this out lightly. This is no big deal. Don't, let's not, don't feel overwhelmed. That's all we need at this point now to start adding color, believe it or not. So I'm going to use, again, Watercolor cakes, it's my favorite um, application for watercolors, these cakes here. I use a mister to go ahead and get it wet. All my little cakes, got spray bottle at home, and I like to go ahead and get each one of them nice and wet. And then I'm gonna start pulling some color out using um, this aqua brush, which gives us even more uh, color. And I'm gonna pull some greens first. So I'm gonna use this tray over here to the side as my mixing tray, as you can see, I've been mixing a lot in the past. And that's good because as you mix with these little travel kits, you can keep colors that you've mixed up in the past. Now the goal for this is to add a lot of deep greens inside of these lines all around our cabin, okay? And you'll start on each side applying these. Be careful not to stick your finger in your watercolor. Um, now we pull these straight up following the lines that you've already made here, these parallel lines. You're just going to draw these lines coming straight up on each side, coloring inside of those. And you can add more as we go. You can actually put some more trees in the background if you want. Pull a little bit of brown, mix that in. And what we're going to do is use a little bit of frisket too in a second. A frisket is something we've talked about on previous shows. Frisket is a masking fluid. And how it works is that wherever you apply it to on the canvas or the paper, you let that dry and that will not um, allow the watercolor to go into that paper um, and, and 
and uh, keeps that part blank or negative, okay? Now I'm going to add a few more lines going off into the distance into the woods here. These are just straight lines. They don't have to be perfect. You can just put as many as you want kind of off into the distance, just like that. We're going to use masking fluid after we put the first round of branches in here with their greens. Now what you're going to, you're going to start at the bottom of each one of your lines and you're going to start putting these color to the side, almost making like these triangle shapes, like arrows, okay? And you're going to keep on going straight up the two parallel lines until you get to the top. And all this is is starting to fill in color. That does not, of course, look like a pine tree right now, but once we start adding more green with a touch of brown in here, and we keep doing this over and over, it's going to start to fill in this space and it's going to give us the uh, effect that there's, there's uh, pine trees here beside this cabin. So you keep going over and over again with these triangle shapes all the way up to the top of each one, just like that, in the background as well. Now, once you start to add this color onto your canvas, you're going to see that this negative space is going to start getting eaten up by um, these branches, and that's what we want. And this is an application that's going to take time because you're going to have to go over each one of these uh, similar how I'm doing here. And you're going to do this over and over again until the color starts to fill out more and more. So what we're going to do is I'm going to go ahead and speed through um, adding the branches and the green to my pine trees. And then you would do the same at home. And then we'll stop here in a second and we'll pick up on the next important step to this uh, to this activity. added the green, we've made our triangle. So far this does not look like a snow scene, of course, but that's going to change in just a little bit. But first we have to have this base coat of paint applied. Um, what I'm going to do now is go around the edges towards the top. We're going to do some blues. Be sure and dilute your brush with water. Uh, make sure that just like with um, working with light to dark earlier with the colored pencils, you do want to uh, dilute this so that you're working light to dark and kind of gradually build up this area all around. Right now, this could be any scene probably, you know, in the middle of spring or summer. Um, but we're going to manipulate this in a way that eventually this is going to turn into a wintry scene. So now with your brush, I want you to take very, very, um, you know, be sort of uh, generous with your water and uh, take your brush and apply some very, very light coats of blue um, all around the edges of your painting. We're going to do that next, and then we're going to stop again in a moment and talk about the next step, which is getting then into more of the wintry aspects of the painting. you saw me mixing uh, to the sky. Notice how I kept this area here light. That's important for later. But now we're going to start working with this roof some. And with this roof, what I want to do is make sure that I don't bring any of that green down. Actually, I'm going to add a little window here while I'm at it. Just something else to add to the uh, little cabin. And with that, we can add some yellow later. But I'm going to put frisket in. Now frisket's that strange liquid masking tool that helps us to keep that watercolor from getting down onto this surface. So I'm going to go ahead and apply that now, even though I'm still working on the trees at this point, because I really do not want any of that green to get down on our roof. I'm going to put this all down this slope of the roof here. I'm even going to include some on the chimney. Now this is a dipstick. This tool is actually made for working with um, frisket and 
it's a really strange substance. It starts to dry almost immediately. And then on top of that, it also uh, can be really sticky. So if you're using it, you want to be use it sparingly and only put it on the areas that you really want to keep um, any color from getting on. So I've added the frisket now. I want to return back again, working with these trees because the goal is to get these trees very dark at the bottom, lighter as you go towards the top. And then later on, we'll add snow. And we're gonna put a layer of frisket down on the bottom of our drawing going across uh, this line here, making up where the start of the forest is behind the little cabin. And maybe put a little bit out here near the front. All right, now with that, we can return back to working with the green. Just remember, go light to dark. And sooner or later here, once we build this up, we're gonna have enough to create the snow. So I'm still working at a little bit of black, a little bit of uh, green, and then go inside here and really put some dark tones to these trees at the bottom. the point my favorite point of working with a winter scene and that's putting the deeper darker hues in as long as well as the snow if you noticed I've been placing some white just um, sort of sporadic around around the limbs of the uh, different trees um, so that's um, working out pretty well the frisket is dried here um, hopefully it's dried all the way because what we have to do in a moment is actually take our finger get inside there and actually remove that frisket so that we could actually see now the uh, more details popping out and the white that we've wanted to save should be um, without any pigment on it now while i'm waiting on that frisket to dry i'm going to go ahead and put the details in the darker hues as i said so this is going around the door the frame of the cabin here um, put some more maybe around the edges now you at home, if you have any uh, art that you'd like to send in to us, we'd love to see it. And if you're anything like me, it's, it's, it's kind of scary sharing your work sometimes, I know. But, you know, uh, I really feel that every artist is, is really super critical of their own work. And you maybe have thought about a few occasions sending in something, and you might haven't because maybe you're worried about, you know, what do people think of it. Well, the thing you have to really understand is that every artist is, is and should strive to be different. So your work may not look like mine, mine not, may not look like yours, and that's fine. I've seen a lot of artists who've actually sent work into the show whose work I've looked at and said, you know, how did they do that? I'd love to be able to do that. So every artist is, is a little self-conscious about their work, and that's fine to be that way. But with that in mind, this is a show that really is not about how well you may be able to draw or paint this is a show that just really focuses on enjoying art and enjoying the process of creating something from nothing together. That's what it's all about. So please consider sending in that work if you haven't yet. Let this be the time that you say, you know what, I'm going to send it in and uh, let my version of whatever it is that you've drawn uh, be shared with the viewing audience because I know a lot of folks would love to see it. That's one of the most, the highlights of the show is actually sharing your work with, other, with others. So please consider sending that in. Now, while I've been talking here, the friskets continue to dry, and we can go up to the top now within all the blue that we've created while we give it a little more time to dry, and I'm going to pull some white in here, and this is going to be now for some adding some snow, and you just got to put some dots, dots here and there, sporadic, doesn't have to be a lot in one area. You don't want to make a well, you could, I guess, make a make it a, um, a blizzard if you wanted to. But I'm just going to put a few, um, a few snowflakes here and there because apparently from the looks of our cabin, we've already had a blizzard. So maybe this, this is that quiet after the storm where things settle down and it's really pretty. Snow is beautiful to look at. And yes, it does make for some dangerous conditions, of course, yes. But um, as long as we all plan ahead and... Um, exercise some uh, good planning for 
for those winter months and what could happen, you know, stay safe is the main point. Uh, then we can enjoy snow from a distance anyway, or out in it if you want for small periods of time. But So now we have exactly what we need, and now we're going to try to remove this frisket. Now, if you do not wait for this to dry long enough, you could have a really, really interesting experience where all your colors just mesh together. But hopefully I think we have, and I could test it out at the bottom. All I'm doing is going to be rubbing my finger across. You see how that's starting to break up some? Maybe you can't. Let's do a little bit bigger section here. There we go. And you can see how it's starting to peel back. And we're left with nothing, really. We're left with the white of the paper underneath the frisket. And I've put a little bit of glow here in the snow from the light coming up from the windows. In case you're wondering what that is, the yellow. And... Of course, as we've mentioned before in a recent show that we did focusing on winter, um, there's colors in snow. If you, you imagine a, a field um, with three or four feet of snow on it, there's going to be shadows and contours to the land and dips and different things like that going on. So any time that you have uh, dips and contours, you're going to have shadow. So snow can be very, very colorful if you want it to be. And then again, there's no rules with art. So you can make it however you want. It's up to you, right? That's one of the best parts about drawing. Still removing this frisket, pushing it from the inside out to the edges. And you can see this all breaks apart. If you let it dry long enough, it really crumbles. Give it a little bit of time to dry like we have. You're going to have a little bit of some, um, some pullback. It's going to be a little bit of some uh, sticky stuff coming off, but uh, you still should be able to pull it all off as you need to. And we should be left at the very end with a white roof and a white chimney and tall evergreens in the background as our little cabin full of little warm people stay safe against all the elements. So I hope you've, hope you've enjoyed today's exercise. This has been one of my favorite parts is doing winter scenes because I love watercolor, I love using frisket, and I love to see how um, using no color can add color, if that makes any sense. But again, please consider sending in your questions and your artwork. We'd love to show it. Please stay safe during these winter months. Plan ahead. Until next time, keep drawing. I'm Christopher Epling for the Art Workshop.